Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Jackie Lemire, a member of the Foggy Bottom Western Village Program Committee. Today, we are very pleased to welcome back Richard Lum, who you may remember presented a well-received talk on the Hokusai exhibit. Today, he will explore the Freer's vast collection of works by Whistler. In fact, it is the best and most complete collection in the world. Richard is a docent at the National Museum of Asian Art, Freer Gallery of Art, and author M. Sackler Gallery at the Smithsonian Institution. He has presented papers and lectures and participated in panel discussions at international conferences and symposia on topics as varied as ancient and modern folkways and Indian and Iranian cultures to managing invasive plant species. A master gardener, Richard attended Rhodes College, the University of Oxford, the University of Washington and Washington State University and holds degrees and certificates in biology, classics, history, and horticulture. Enjoy your time with Richard and with Whistler. Richard, it's all yours. Thank you, Jackie. Um, well, welcome everyone. Um, it's uh, good to see some familiar faces. I do remember um, some of you from our Hokusai tour in the fall. And um, I hope that um, you will note I have brought some Hokusai in with us. Before we get started, I just wanted to um, do a quick poll um, and take a moment and answer these questions uh, if you like. Uh, it's always good to gauge and see, you know, how many people have been to the museum before and how familiar you may be with uh, some of our art, especially um, our Whistler. And um, there's an interesting bit of Whistler trivia I just discovered um, a few months ago that I thought was uh, interesting. I'd never heard um, of Whistler's perspective on this particular color um, before. So I'll just give everyone another few minutes, few moments to um, chime in. And Jack and I were just uh, talking that my uh, virtual background is the courtyard of the Freer in the snow. It's not, I did not take the photograph, but it was taken two years ago um, by a visitor to the museum. All right, well, most of you have uh, voted in the poll, so I'm going to end it in just a moment and we'll see. Um, ah, no one guessed a particular color at the end. That's interesting, but a majority of you guessed correctly. <laughs> Mo, yes. And a good number of you know about Whistler's checkered history. And almost all of you have been to the Freer um, or Sackler before. That's great. So with that, let's get started. Um, again, my name is Richard and um, Jonas will be monitoring the chat. I will try to do so too throughout. So put any questions you have there and let's get started about Whistler. So a little bit about the museum and why we have uh, the world's largest collection of James Abbott McNeil Whistler's work is our founder, uh, Charles Lang Freer wanted to, to um, give his art to the people of the United States. And in 1906, the Smithsonian Institution Board of Regents accepted his gift of art and his collection of Asian art and his small collection of American art. Um, and the gift was also accompanied by uh, funds for the building of the museum and an endowment, not, not only for um, the building itself, staffing the building, but also for future collections. And over the next uh, 13 years before Mr. Freer died, his collection grew exponentially. Before his death in 1919, he worked with the architect Charles Abbott Adams Platt to create the Italian net structure um, with the portico courtyard that we see today. It remains one of the most elegant museum structures in the world. Um, in terms of scale, history, proportion of materials and lighting, the Freer uh, reveals, you know, a sensitivity of harmony that uh, Mr. Freer wanted visitors to experience as he thought um, his art should be experienced. Um, he often uh, wrote about quiet contemplation and he wanted his museum to have the same environment that he had in his home in Detroit. Uh, think about the courtyard or think about 
um, sitting in the hallway on those lovely benches and you really uh, get a, a sense of how he wanted his art to be experienced. And Freer's concept of art was is best summed up as for those with the power to see beauty, as he said, all works of art go together, whatever the period. And he would often compare very different works of art um, together. Here we have um, a Raqqa Syrian uh, stone uh, pot, a ceramic vessel from probably the 17th century in Syria, next to a Whistler um, oil painting of the goddess Venus. And, you know, it's great that we have photographs of Freer himself looking at some of his art. And here we can see Mr. Freer looking at these two objects that we still have in our collection. And when we display these objects, sometimes, um, visitors look at them and question why these two objects are next to each other. Um, but just, just as if Mr. Freer were looking at them, when you do observe them, there are some amazing similarities that you, that you can only discern when you really look at these objects closely uh, side by side. And so with Whistler's guidance, uh, Mr. Freer formed a collection of almost a thousand works by Whistler the artist himself. And um, corresponding shortly before Whistler's death, uh, the two friends uh, remarked on how well formed and how perfect the American art collection had become. And it's actually a stipulation in the Freer Trust that the museum cannot obtain any new works of American art. So not only can we not obtain any, we can't um, deaccession or, or, or sell any of our American works of art and they can't go on tour so they cannot leave the museum so we are blessed that we have such an extensive collection of American art of Whistler art um, and that people from around the world must come to one place the Freer to see it all um, and Whistler's influence on Freer extended beyond uh, works by the artist himself and works of American art um, the artist also inspired Mr. Freer to travel to Asia, travel to China and Japan. And that's where Freer amassed a sizable collection of Asian art. Um, and shortly before uh, his death, when uh, Mr. Freer was giving over his collection of Asian and American art, he was buying additional works of Asian art and selling a lot. He was really picking through his collection because he only wanted the best works of art. Um, to be shown in his museum um, in Washington, D.C. And through what Whistler considered an accident of birth, uh, his life began uh, in the industrial town of Lowell, Massachusetts, uh, during the age of Jacksonian democracy. And, and Whistler's characteristic elitism may be rooted in the years that he spent in Imperial Russia as a child. His family lived uh, in considerable luxury in St. Petersburg. His father was an engineer and um, he directed the construction of a railroad between uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg. And after the Whistler family returned to the United States, Whistler did, as many of you uh, uh, noted in the, in the poll, uh, he briefly attended the United States military, military Academy at West Point. He did withdraw. <laughs> And he became a draftsman actually before making his career as an artist, uh, first uh, just up the road from here in Baltimore. And then uh, he left for Paris uh, to study formerly. Um, and once he moved to Paris, he never returned to the, the United States. And here we have a portrait of Whistler in our collection um, with a hat. And we will get back to this uh, self-portrait in a moment. And I wanted to start with this beautiful painting, Oops, sorry, this beautiful painting, um, Harmony and Gold, Blue and Gold, The Little Blue Girl. And you know, why is this um, such a wonderful piece to start with when we talk about Whistler? And as I mentioned, Fur not only relied upon Whistler for his expertise and his eye in art, but they really became close friends. And this painting shows uh, or is 
derive from uh, some key moments in their friendship. Um, in 1894, Whistler wrote to Freer with a suggestion that he paint for him. So the artist was saying, I want to paint for you a figure that I have in my mind. Um, and uh, Whistler wrote, a figure to, in a way, hint at spring. I dare say I shall manage something charming. And of course, Freer immediately agreed. Um, he visited Whistler when he was living in Paris and he saw the painting in progress. He paid for the commission in full as soon as he saw what had already been done. And um, Freer was very excited to, to receive this piece from Whistler, but he would not receive uh, this work for more than a decade um, after that. And, you know, when we look closely at this painting, uh, especially for Freer, this painting epitomized what Freer wrote once, the most mysterious and beautiful qualities of the artist. And although Freer himself never declared this work to be a masterpiece, um, he did consider this paintings, he wrote, one of the most, one of the great productions of modern times. And Freer indeed, he treasured this painting um, because it was a great painting, but also because of the personal associations connected with it. Um, and to, 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 to learn about that, we have to go back a little bit in time for when they first met. And Whistler and Freer first met in 1890. Uh, it was Freer's first trip to London, and Freer was intent on meeting the artist. Um, he had not written to Whistler in advance, but he showed up at Whistler's um, studio with the intent on meeting the artist himself. And at this point in Whistler's career, he had already had a successful career in London, um, producing some of his most well-known paintings, uh, particularly under the patron Frederick Richards Leyland, who will come into play later. Um, and Whistler had already gone bankrupt, relocated to Venice, uh, where he produced his famous etchings and pastels, and then started his watercolors, and then had returned uh, to London. And so in the years that followed, uh, as Freer's Whistler collection expanded, he wrote, he corresponded with the artist regularly, and uh, Whistler's wife, Beatrix, um, would often respond on the artist's behalf. Um, and Freer developed a relationship uh, with the couple where he would write to Whistler's wife, knowing, or Whistler, but also knowing that, um, also knowing that Beatrix would be reading the letters. He would often, you know, write little messages to Beatrix, even in the letter he might have addressed uh, to the artist. And so uh, what, at some point, uh, because of their friendship, Beatrix had sketched this little caricature of Freer and note how he has this, this halo above him, um, you know, a nod to the patron's uh, beneficence on the artist and the couple. Um, and so Freer had expected to receive this little blue girl um, shortly after the painting was finished and exhibited in Paris uh, five years later in 1895, but it was not completed. Um, Whistler was still working on it a little bit as he did with so many other works. And at this time, Beatrix was stricken with cancer um, and Whistler was unable to work for months. And um, so after seeing the couple in Paris, Freer embarked on his first trip to Asia and he knew that Beatrix was fond of birds. And so when he was in India, he bought two birds. <laughs> and sent them back to Paris to comfort Beatrix um, because he knew she was ill. And he located a pair of shamas um, outside of Calcutta. And he asked a British sea captain uh, to care for the birds and transport them back to the Whistlers. Um, only one of the birds survived the journey and eventually made its way to the couple's home. Uh, it did keep Beatrix company until her death uh, a year later in 1896. And Whistler could not even bear to respond to Freer's course, uh, letters for many months. Um, this is while Freer was in Asia. And um, when he finally responded, Whistler wrote, Sir, your little blue and gold girl is doing her best, uh, looking lovely for you. And he went on to describe the consolation he took in Freer's songbird during Beatrix's final moments. 
Um, and he wrote, and when she went alone, because I was unfit to go to, the strange, wild, dainty creature stood uplifted on the topmost perch and sang and sang. And it had never sung as if it had never sung before in a song of the sun and of joy and of my despair, loud and ringing clear from the skies and louder peal after peal until it became a marvel, the tiny beast torn by such glorious voice should live. And suddenly it was made known to me that in this mysterious magpie waif from beyond the temples of India, the spirit of my beautiful lady had lingered on its way. And the song was her song of love and courage and command that the work in which she had taken her part should be complete. And so was her farewell. And so, you know, that's a, that's a clearly a heartfelt sentiment um, for the widower to write about um, the passing of his wife um, and this bird, a token of friendship and even weaving in um, the painting that meant so much to Whistler um, that had some inspiration not only from his friendship but also uh, from his his wife um, and we do know uh, the type of bird and this is a shama this is the specific type of bird that was sent from Freer to the Whistlers um, uh, and so sorry you know, during this period of grief, Whistler, he continued to return uh, to the little blue girl um, and uh, he wrote to Freer about the painting and said, I write to you many letters on this canvas. And so, you know, uh, after Whistler finally um, died and Freer uh, received the painting, he, he had anticipated it for quite some time and, and it really did mean um, a lot to uh, Freer when he received the painting um, in 1903, shortly after um, the artist's uh, death. So it did take him almost a decade um, to receive this uh, commission. And I haven't checked the chat. Are there any questions, Jonas? There were a few, uh, yeah. none, none that are urgent. They can wait to the end if you prefer, or we can go over them now. Um, let's wait till the end. Um, it, yeah, if, if, you, if you think that's good, yeah. Okay. So, um, and it's interesting too that uh, Mr. Freer, he allowed his name to be engraved over the doorway of our magnificent museum, but his likeness only appears in this one small work uh, in the collection. It's an unfinished portrait by Whistler. Um, and this was started in 1902. This was uh, barely a year and a half before the artist died. Um, Freer was in London uh, shopping for art and he claimed he had no interest in having his portrait done. Um, he had had some photographic portraits made. He didn't like any of them. Um, and people were always asking him, why don't you have Whistler paint, you know, paint your portrait? Whistler had painted some very famous uh, portraits. Um, but he, Freer did confide in a friend at the time. He said he hoped Whistler would not, um, uh, quote, waste uh, valuable time on such a valueless theme. Um, but uh, Whistler insisted on making a portrait of Freer, and so Freer sat for him, and Whistler actually told him specifically what jacket, it was a brown jacket that he wanted him to wear uh, for the sitting. So Whistler did have in his mind how he wanted uh, uh, Mr. Freer to be depicted in this uh, portrait. And uh, shortly after the sittings for this portrait began, uh, the, the two men traveled together to the Netherlands. They wanted to see an exhibition of art by Rembrandt. And um, of course, it's the palette of some of the Dutch uh, uh, masters, such as Rembrandt, that really influenced some of the tonalities that we see, especially in Whistler's early art, but also in uh, a lot of his portraits, including this portrait of Mr. Freer. And while they were in The Hague, um, Whistler became seriously ill. Um, his death, his, his health uh, declined. Um, through the next year and he, but he kept working on this, this portrait of Mr. Freer and uh, Freer wrote to a friend, he said, he's making me look like a Pope. Um, but he said, there will of course be a little of Freer in it, but it will surely be all Whistler. Um, and in fact, uh, they, um, uh, Freer had visited Whistler every day for several weeks um, and he had seen him the day before he died and he was on his way to see Whistler and he only arrived uh, to see Whistler uh, about five minutes after he had uh, passed. 
Um, but I spoke about Rembrandt and um, this is a very early portrait. This is the self-portrait of Whistler and it is titled Whistler, uh, it's a portrait of Whistler with a hat. Um, and when Whistler left Baltimore, uh, his, some of his friends gave him money specifically to live in Paris and study art. Um, so he arrived in 1855. He rented a studio in the Latin Quarter and he really adopted um, the lifestyle of a bohemian um, artist. He uh, soon had a French girlfriend. Um, she was a dressmaker named Eloise and he studied traditional art um, at uh, Eco Imperial and um, he was at an atelier uh, for a period of time. Um, Mark Charles uh, Gabriel Claire, um, who impressed upon Whistler two important principles that um, Whistler would use throughout the rest of his career. One, um, that line is more important than color. And two, that black is the fundamental color of tonal harmony. Um, and 20 years later, uh, Impressionists would overthrow both of these two critical elements of Whistler's art philosophy. Uh, you know, they banned black and brown as forbidden colors and emphasized color over form. Um, but indeed, Whistler preferred self-study and he, it included him copying famous works of art at the Louvre um, and enjoying cafe life. I mean, what a, what a bohemian lifestyle, right? Um, and his letters from home, uh, corresponding with his mother, um, she, he reported on his efforts at economy, but we do know at this time that Whistler spent freely. He sold little or nothing of his art uh, the first year he was in Paris, um, and he grew his debt steadily. Um, and to relieve the situation, some of the paintings he had undertaken, the copying he had done at the Louvre, um, he was selling these. Um, uh, and was finally able to move into cheaper uh, quarters and make somewhat of a subsistence living, copying famous works of art the Louvre and selling them. Um, note in this portrait, the somewhat bold um, signature uh, in the bottom left. And as frequently is the case with young artists trying to create a self-portrait, he identifies himself with a past master. Um, surely, while he was in the Louvre, he studied this famous uh, Rembrandt uh, painting. Um, uh, it's a self-portrait by Rembrandt. It's a portrait of a man in a beret. And, you know, Whistler adopted Rembrandt's general format, as well as this dark, rich palette. Um, and, I, you know, this, this portrait exhibits, you know, some fastidious fashion consciousness, I think, uh, but uh, his hat is inarguably, you know, very similar in theme to the, um, uh, the one of Rembrandt. All right, so with that, uh, this is the first work of, this is the first oil of Whistler's that was purchased by Mr. Freer, and it's one of our most famous uh, paintings. Um, this was in, uh, purchased by Freer in 1892, and this was the same year that Freer began to collect Japanese prints. Um, Whistler subsequently uh, encouraged Freer himself to travel to East Asia and seek out even more rare examples of Japanese and Chinese culture to complement um, Freer's already quite large uh, American art collection, uh, particularly his growing collection of Whistlers. And, um, you know, Freer told John Galatly, a fellow uh, American collector, throughout the uh, entire range of Whistler's art, uh, one feels the exercise of spiritual influences similar to those of the masters of Chinese and Japanese art. And of course, Mr. Whistler does unite the art of the Occident with that of the Orient. So I think despite the um, dated language, we certainly understand Freer's perspective of Whistler's art and the influences on um, Whistler from Asian art. 
And this is a pivotal work in Whistler's um, uh, uh, art. Uh, in the balcony, you know, it's between these Japanese, Japonesque costume pictures um, that we have from the 1860s and, um, you know, of the fully synthesized approach uh, to Japanese art that you can see in some of Whistler's paintings, like the Nocturnes that he painted in, in London. And, you know, uh, he used these terms like nocturnes uh, that, you know, they're, they evoke uh, an abstract image and, you know, they're, they're kind of these dark um, paintings that he produced in the 1870s. Um, and although he never visited Asia, Whistler began to collect Japanese art. Um, and he had fans, lacquer work, woodblock prints, um, and folding screens. Uh, and you know, it's interesting to look at uh, how rigid um, Whistler's early art education was because um, he really was seeking to distance himself from this formality. And um, even, you know, the, just the French realism school and Japanese art really um, gave Whistler some inspiration and dis a way to distance himself uh, from that kind of of art and the balcony with these flattened forms, you know, um, it does borrow elements that are very clearly Japanese and Asian, but um, uh, it, some of these women could have popped out of an ukiyo-e Japanese print, uh, but also, you know, it's fantastical too. There are butterflies uh, floating around, there's a fantasy, um, and what's really interesting about this painting is the signature. So I noted this, the bold, somewhat bold signature of the, the self-portrait from earlier in his artistic career. But um, this is a stylized red um, butterfly. Um, and it's imprinted on this oblong cartouche. And this, you know, is reminiscent of uh, perhaps a, a seal from a Japanese artist or red uh, Japanese artist seal. And um, later Whistler would eliminate the cartouche and just use a butterfly cipher um, to sign a lot of his works of art. And uh, for those of you who, who joined us um, for the Hokusai tour, you might remember that I mentioned that in one of Whistler's lectures, he had noted that Whistler was, uh, that Hokusai was one of the world's great artists. And um, here's another self-portrait of the artist and note, he has signed it with a butterfly cipher and not like his other self-portrait um, with his name. And so, um, when we look at this painting, this is one of the first paintings that Whistler completed um, upon his uh, first time living in London. And at first glance, um, the painting doesn't make sense. The perspective is all wrong. Um, and, uh, you know, people ask, you know, why did he move from Paris to London? His half-sister uh, was living in London. Uh, Whistler, ever the artist, was always looking for a different inspiration, looking for a change. Um, and while he still corresponded and did commissions for some patrons in uh, France, uh, he really wanted to move. So he moved to London, his half sister was there. His mother um, came and lived with him for a period of time um, in London. And so this uh, painting actually depicts a room in Whistler's half sister's home, uh, Deborah Hayden. Um, and that is a reflection of her, of his half-sister in the mirror on the left. And his da uh, her daughter, Anne, um, is absorbed reading this book. And uh, a family friend, um, Isabella Abbott, uh, uh, Isabella Boots, sorry. Um, she's in the black writing um, costume. Um, and, you know, this, is kind of a boldly painted uh, figure. And it, it's kind of a marked contrast, right, to his sister's gray, his half-sister's gray gown. And here you have this 
you know, friend who's, who's come in in her writing costume is very bold. And so the contrasts here are interesting. The perspectives are all off, um, but it's what Whistler, you know, a, as he was adapting to London life, this is what he painted. This is how he um, uh, saw uh, a lot of this uh, uh, life here. And um, Whistler praised this work uh, in a letter um, to his wife at the time, he said, uh, such sunshine and such color <laughs> uh, before the painting was uh, exhibited. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to look at this painting as a whole, but when you really look at the components, it's, um, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece. And for those of you who joined us in October, you will note, um, you will remember this a hanging scroll in speaking color on silk by Hokusai. And um, again, uh, not only is the Freer home to the largest collection of Whistlers, we're also the home to the largest collection of Hokusai paintings, drawings, and sketches. And um, out of all of the paintings in the Hokusai collection, this is one of the most beautiful and uh, most popular. But I can't ever look at this Hokusai painting without immediately thinking of the princess from the land of porcelain. And for those of you who have been to the museum, uh, you know that it, uh, that the princess permanently resides above the fireplace in the peacock room. And this uh, painting was a series of costume pictures that Whistler painted um, starting in the mid 1860s. And, uh, what all these in this series of paintings, there were Western models dressed in Asian um, gowns, often with Chinese and Japanese objects um, from Whistler's own collection. Some of the ceramics and screens and fans um, Whistler actually owned. He used them as models um, in his painting. And here uh, in in the Princess, uh, the noted Victorian beauty Christina. Uh, Spartali, she strikes a pose, and you know this kind of recalls the elongated figure of the Hokusai uh, women, uh, sorry beauties in gowns. Um, and even, again, even though Whistler never visited Asia, he did borrow obviously extensively from Asian objects um, and uh, drawings and uh, prints. Uh, and so the model we know actually. A considerable, considerable amount about her. Um, she was a daughter of a cotton merchant who lived in London, um, and Christina and her sister Marie were extraordinarily well educated uh, for women of their time, and uh, but they were equally known for their beauty. Um, Christina's sister Marie was an artist, um, and she was one of the only uh, female artists uh, in the second generation of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Uh, I think she was, there were two or three women in that group, so um, she was, her sister was well regarded as an artist in her own right. Um, and the princess was actually originally commissioned as a portrait. Um, Spartale's father refused to purchase it, um, and there are uh, several different theories about why that happened. Um, might have been um, the way that uh, his daughter was depicted in the portrait, or it could have been the signature. Um, you know, it's large uh, because he didn't purchase it and it went on exhibition. A critic, an early critic did note that the signature was very distracting uh, from the rest of the piece. Um, in any case, the princess, it was purchased uh, in 1867 by the shipping magnate Frederick Richards Leyland, and he hung it in his London dining room where he displayed his extensive collection of Gangshi porcelain. Um, this is an artist's rendering of what um, the living room and, uh, sorry, the dining room in Frederick Richards Leyland's uh, house looked like um, at the time. And Whistler suggested some changes to the color scheme of the room. And he told Leyland that these changes would better harmonize with the palette uh, of the princess. And in this artist rendering, you can see uh, the peacock room before uh, Whistler got a hold of it. 
Uh, most of the room is recognizable to its form today. The arch uh, renowned London architect um, Thomas Jekyll had been commissioned to build a room for uh, Leyland's display of his porcelain, and this is what he came up with. And um, uh, here we have a beautiful uh, photograph from the Peacock Room when it was in Mr. Furr's home in Detroit. Um, and uh, some of the curators have in the past painstakingly looked at these photographs and gone through our collection and um, found the objects that Freer installed on the shelves and reinstalled them in the Peacock Room in uh, the Freer Gallery to reflect how Freer saw the room and how he used the room when it was at his uh, residence in um, Detroit. And, oops, sorry. And so the same year that Freer acquired the Peacock Room um, and had it reassembled at his home in Detroit, the princess finally was reunited um, with the room. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, after Freer's death, the Peacock Room was disassembled at his home in Detroit, reassembled <clears throat> in the Freer Gallery where it is in its um, current place. So we started with Harmony, Harmony in Blue and Gold, um, and we are finishing with the other Harmony in, and Blue Gold, this much larger <laughs> work of art than the little blue girl, um, the Peacock Room. And the history of this room uh, is best understood as, as a story in two parts. Uh, Whistler is at the center, and either side of him are his two most important patrons, Frederick Richards Leyland, uh, ship owner from Liverpool who wanted to transform his London mansion into a palace of art, uh, and Charles Langfreer, the Detroit industrialist um, whose art collection forms the basis of the Freer Gallery of Art. Um, and here are two artist depictions of the room as it progressed into its current form. And uh, after Leyland hired Whistler to decorate the entrance hall to the townhome um, in 1876, uh, Thomas Jekyll, the architect, was working on the dining room. And uh, the painting by Whistler, the princess, was already hung above the fireplace. Uh, Leyland had insisted that the fireplace and the framing around it be constructed to accentuate um, the princess and um, Jekyll, the architect working on the dining room, had asked for uh, Whistler's advice on the room. And with Leyland's consent, um, as I mentioned earlier, Whistler, he retouched the walls um, and was supposed to decorate a little bit of the uh, wainscoting and the cornice work. Um, and that would be pretty much everything that uh, Leyland had expected uh, Whistler to do to the room. So with that, with that nearly done, uh, the social season was over in London and Leyland and his family returned uh, to Liverpool to their home, uh, Speak Hall. And here you can see the work that uh, Leyland had approved for Whistler to do to put some kind of wave pattern on the wainscoting and to paint something on the cornice work. And um, while Whistler was finishing this, he was writing to Leyland and he wrote, um, he wrote to Leyland that uh, there is a brilliant and gorgeous surprise awaiting him when he returned. And uh, you know, Whistler entertained visitors and newspaper reporters and they were publishing amusing accounts of Whistler, Whistler's antics in this room as he started painting peacock feathers on the ceiling, peacocks on the shutters. Um, and when Leyland finally saw the room and its brilliance and high price, uh, it was a lot more than he had expected. Um, there was a bitter quarrel. Um, we have all the correspondence between them and they fought bitterly over this room because uh, Leyland had not commissioned 
a room to be completely decorated with peacocks. Um, and he certainly had not expected Whistler to ask for a huge sum of money, 2,000 guineas, um, for the room. And um, Leyland finally agreed to pay the artist, so the artist fi finished the work on the room. But uh, Leyland reminded um, Whistler that he had already commissioned and paid in full for a work of art to go on the long wall opposite of the princess. And Whistler had already painted um, Symphony in White number one, um, the white girl, and you can see that today at the National Gallery of Art. Um, he had already completed Symphony in White number two, um, the little white girl, and it's at the Tate Gallery um, in London, and he had finished Symphony in White number three, which is the Barber Institute in Birmingham, and Leyland had paid a full commission to Whistler to paint Symphony in White number four. It was to be Whistler's largest painting ever, and Whistler worked on it for over a decade, and um, Whistler had described it to several people as his perfection of art. And so Leyland said, I, I will buy it from you and already paid for it in full. Um, and Whistler reminded him of that. So with their quarreling over the, the 2000 guinea price of the room, finally, Leyland said, I shall pay half. I shall pay you one thousand. I shall pay you. I shall pay you half. And uh, Whistler said, "Fine, I shall pay half, and you shall pay half." Because Whistler wanted in his head to to keep the two thousand guinea value um, alive, and so he paid him one thousand. Uh, Leyland paid Whistler one thousand, but he expressed the amount on the check in pounds and not guineas. The pound is what you pay tradespeople with. Guinea is what you would pay a gentleman or an artist with. And not only that, there are 20 shillings in a pound and there are 21 shillings in, the, in a guinea. So when Whistler came back into the room, he painted the famous mural of the fighting peacocks. Um, and Whistler famously titled the piece art and money or the story of the room. Uh, when it was finished, Whistler left the room and he never saw it again. And in this painting of the fighting peacocks, uh, we definitely can see the allegory and anyone who would have known uh, Whistler and the story uh, of, of his patronage would definitely have known that, uh, what was going on in this painting. On the left-hand side, we have the famous butterfly cipher of Whistler. And also the peacock, on, that same peacock on the left has this gray forelock and piercing blue eyes. And, and Whistler was famous. Uh, every, everyone in his family had a gray forelock or several members of his family and he had a gray forelock. Um, and he would even tie it up with a red ribbon um, in parties so people would see him from across the room. But he was also known for his piercing blue eyes and there's a little gemstone here, a blue gemstone in the eye, and this haughty peacock on the right, you know, kind of looks like he's got these um, rust, rustly uh, breast feathers, and Leyland was known for wearing these ruffled shirts that were very out of fashion at this time, and, and Whistler even made fun of him in public for wearing these um, kind of dated shirts. But if you look more closely at this peacock, oh, and this peacock also has a, a gray um, kind of a silvery stone as his eye, and uh, Leyland had um, uh, that color eyes. But if you look closely at the breast feathers, you know, what do they look like? And even at the feet, it's coins. And so, um, you know, this peacock on the right, this Leyland, is literally made out of money. And um, at the feet of the Leyland Peacock are more coins. And these are platinum leaf because silver leaf uh, tarnishes. These are shillings. These are the shillings that Leyland shorted uh, Whistler in paying him for the room. So Whistler was infuriated, uh, Leyland was infuriated by this. Um, he, he did pay um, a thousand pounds for the room. 
Um, but he did say that if he ever, he wrote a letter to Whistler, if he ever saw Whistler speaking to a member of his family, uh, again, he would publicly horsewhip him, ban from the house. And it's unfortunate because the following year, Whistler had the famous libel case against Ruskin. Uh, Whistler won, um, but his damages were for a farthing. Um, his legal expenses uh, drove him to bankruptcy. And guess who the administrator of Whistler's bankruptcy was? Leyland. Um, it's really how Leyland obtained some of the better uh, works of Whistler in his collection. And when Leyland and the uh, workers came to Whistler's studio to seize it for the bankruptcy, they were met by this <laughs> painting, <laughs> the gold scab. We don't own this. This is in the, uh, the Young Museum in San Francisco. But um, Leyland was known for uh, playing the piano and um, the White House was uh, the artist's studio. So here you have a grotesque figure playing the piano, the gold scab, eruption and filthy lucre, um, also known as the creditor, <laughs> sitting on the artist's studio, the White House, playing the piano. And that was, this painting was left on an easel at the artist's studio. So when Leyland walked in the door, that was the first thing he saw. Um, and so the story of the room, you know, circulated and, um, after Leyland's death, uh, the house was sold, his collection was sold, um, and eventually Freer found out that the subsequent owner of the home wanted to tear out <laughs> the, um, peacock room. She wanted to, she wanted to tear it out. Um, someone informed her it was worth a lot of money. And so Freer saw the opportunity to buy the room and he quietly purchased it. He had already uh, purchased the princess two years earlier, um, you know, not, not ever even thinking he could buy the room. Um, and here's a, 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 a news article from the time when Freer bought the home in London, had it shipped to Detroit uh, and reassembled there. And um, I love the, the headline is, Famous walls which record the eccentric artist's erratic genius to decorate a Detroit home. And uh, Freer was, uh, uh, he really made his early career as a uh, accountant at, at, in the paymaster's office of, of a factory, and he kept receipts for everything. And here we have the original receipt uh, from Freer purchasing uh, the Peacock Room and um, he bought it for 8,400 pounds, and that included packing it up and shipping it to Detroit. And in fact, once upon a time, um, after the dedication of the Freer Museum in 1923, we're about to get to our uh, centennial, um, the courtyard had peacocks, and they would be at in the courtyard during most of the summer, and they would winter at the National Zoo. Um, you know, they were a little messy and a little loud and obnoxious, so they got rid of those. And you know, today, when we look at the Peacock Room, it's notably situated at, between the Asian galleries and the American art galleries. And um, it's, you know, no longer primarily a story about art and money, but it's, you know, it's a chapter in, you know, the history of art and what Whistler called the story of the beautiful. Um, and We've seen the Peacock Room in many iterations. Here's the Peacock Room when they were preparing an installation and they called it Peacock Reveal. And so uh, it was the shelving completely empty so you could really appreciate um, the colors on the walls. And this is uh, the installation Peacock Room Comes to America. This is uh, the curators spend a lot of time looking at the old photographs of the Peacock Room in Freer's home in Detroit and found most of the objects they think uh, were on the shelves. And so they tried to install uh, the room as it was in um, Freer's home in Detroit. Don't worry, this is not really the Peacock Room. This is the um, artist, Darren Watterson. <laughs> this was somewhat inspired by uh, Filthy Lucre, the creditor uh, painting, but also this is uh, Darren Watterson's envisioning the Peacock Room as if it collapsed upon the weight of its own extravagance. I think 
is uh, how he put it. And this is how you will see the Peacock Room when you come back to the museum when we finally reopen, completely reinstalled with blue and white uh, porcelain um, and uh, two of the walls are period pieces. Two of the walls are reproductions. We just don't have enough uh, blue and white uh, porcelain um, in our collections. And so uh, they were commissioned specifically um, for that. And once we reopen, uh, hopefully on the third Thursday of the month, they will reopen the shutters. And it's interesting to see the room in natural light because the really the colors of the ceiling being gold on blue, and as you come down, blue on gold is really um, striking, right? So with that, uh, we'll take some questions. Um, Thank you very much. I know you have to leave right at noon, so I, yes. I think I gotta do a couple, race through a couple quick questions. Yeah. Um, and then I just do wanna say thank you for coming back and giving another uh, fascinating talk. Yes. Um, a couple of people ask questions about the frames. Are, are, do, you, do you think he, he purpose built the frames or bought the frames specifically for um, some of the pieces of work? Yeah, so some of, some of the uh, frames are purpose, um, some of the frames are purpose built. Uh, this one in particular um, was designed by Whistler himself. Um, he, he worked with several um, architects and other artists uh, four frames and Freer also uh, worked um, with um, artists and architects for some of the frames that we have with them. But most of the framed whistlers we have are the frames are specific for them and original. Um, you'll note in some of the paintings I showed you by Whistler, like his own self portrait, doesn't have a frame, it never had a frame. And even um, uh, the balcony doesn't have a, have a frame. It had a frame, but it was not the original frame. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, to keep moving, how much of Whistler's work was based on Freer's patronage? Do they have any specific agreement or arrangement? They did not for a certain number, you know, for a set number or for a period of time, but they uh, did correspond um, directly. Um, they did commission a few pieces, and notably his portrait, um, but really um, they would correspond about art and sometimes Whistler would suggest, oh, I have, I think I have what you're looking for <laughs> from one of his own pieces, not only, you know, from other artists, but uh, they didn't have a specific agreement, but um, they did work together and Whistler would not only recommend that he purchase certain pieces, uh, but um, would offer, you know, his own uh, art to, to Freer. Um, great. I'm going to ask one last question, then I'll let you get on. Uh, but where in Baltimore did he study? Someone asked. Did he, he didn't. Oh, yeah. Sorry. So he didn't study uh, formally. He, um, I forget the name of his friends, but he lived in their home um, near, uh, 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 in Mount Vernon, the Mount Vernon neighborhood, um, near the Washington Monument in Baltimore. And they, you know, they basically, they were friends of his and said, you can live with us and do your art. Um, and he did, it, it was only a few months. And these were his friends who gave, just gave him money to go to Paris and study art. And I, I am sorry, I don't know if he studied partic in a particular uh, studio or not, um, but it was only for a few months. Great, uh, well, I know you have to get moving. So I definitely yeah. wanna say thank you very much for coming back and giving another sure. uh, fascinating talk. Sure, and Hopefully we'll see you again. Yes, absolutely. And I'm sure Jackie wants to echo that as well. Um, but thank you all for coming, um, and I will send out the link to it, and hopefully you'll join us at uh, an upcoming event in the next couple of weeks as well. Great. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much.